Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The title of the talk is Continuity and Change in the Interpretation of Sharia, looking at the, a particular case of Ayatollah Sani's treatment of the regulations, Sharia regulations pertaining to non-Muslims. So Ayatollah Sani'i, as has been mentioned already, is associated with a range of distinctive fiqhi opinions. And he's been described in some of the secondary literature within the academic literature you know, as institutionalizing a new method of ijtihad and even a paradigm shift in 12 illegal theory. And this actually, I want to say, has othered Ayatollah Sani'i, you know, positioned him as something very, very different, even by those who are sympathetic to his ideas. I actually want to build on the platform which Ayatollah Muhakkik has given us and actually argue that his views are developed firmly within the mainstream Shia Usuli system. So as Ayatollah Sani, as Ayatollah Muhakkik described, you know, Ayatollah Sani was the second generation of um, the graduates of the modern Qum seminary. And his ideas, even these distinctive fiqh ideas, were developed within mainstream Shia legal methodology. And of the two key aspects which Ayatollah Muhakkik has already emphasized, there's a commitment to this fundamental Shia moral rationalism that um, Ayatollah Muhakkik introduced to us as this idea, uh, this idea which is held as a fundamental principle of Shia theology, that moral good and moral bad can be understood independently of um, revelation and the emphasis which she has hold on divine justice. Furthermore, in his jurisprudential work, we see that Ayatollah Sani elaborates on existing views and he uses methods which are typical of Shia Usulis. And I will argue that it is his commitment to tradition which allows for change across his fatawa. Because of his commitment to his ideas, it leads to what we might actually say radical change in his, in his you know, juristic opinions. And this can be seen in his views on the ahkam regarding the kuffar, which is the case that we will examine today. So for Ayatollah Sani'i, very, very clearly, repeatedly, extensively, you know, he elaborates and emphasizes that the kafir is a particular category of non-Muslim. It doesn't equal non-Muslim. So the kafir, in an apparent sense, the dhahir of this term, kafir, actually refers to an obstinate or stubborn denier, okay? Somebody who is jahid, somebody who has attained knowledge, okay? And as he puts it, the argument against him has been made in its entirety. So the evidence for truth has been made entirely. Okay, and the, the, uh, this kafir has actually recognized the truth, yet they persist in their disassociation with the truth and in their rejection of Islam. So this is the apparent sense of kafir for Ayatollah Sani. The term non-Muslim then is more general. Okay, the term non-Muslim includes somebody whose errors are blameworthy, the culpable negligent individual, somebody who is, if you like, a kafir in the above sense, somebody who's recognized the truth, okay, who has been lazy in the pursuit of the truth, okay, or still rejects the truth, somebody who can be held accountable for their errors. So non-Muslim includes such an individual, but also includes the innocently mistaken, you know, those who are qasirin, those who maybe were unable to discover the truth, okay, or had some obstacles in their pursuit of truth, or have submitted to the truth to the extent that it was disclosed to them. So we see non-Muslim here is a broader category than kafir. And now usuli is a, a note here just to remind us as we go through that a fundamental principle, actually arguably of Muslim legal theory per se, is that we assume the apparent meaning of a statement is the intended meaning of a statement unless we have evidence to the contrary. Okay, so this basic principle of Asarat al Duhur, okay, is one where we assume a, a speaker means what they seem to be saying. Now, when it comes to the term kafir, Ayatollah Sani, to repeat this foundational premise, 
is arguing that the apparent sense of the term kafir is that it refers exclusively to the obstinate or stubborn denier and not to all non-Muslims. Okay. So, this view hasn't come from nowhere. It hasn't come out of the blue. There is clear usuli Shia precedent for Sani's views in this case. Now, this is often described as a Mu'tazili view of the Kafir, but I think that's too restrictive. We see this as a view which is built, okay, and um, consistently in usuli thought. And I give some examples or an example from modern um, Shia usuli um, ideas, and that is Mirza Qummi. So this was a first generation student of Wahid Bahani, okay, where he's discussing in his work of legal theory and um, the question of the salvation of non-Muslims. So for Mirza Qummi, non-Muslims are not destined for hell simply due to their incorrect beliefs, okay? Uh, as so long as they are not stubborn before the truth, nor willfully negligent in the pursuit of that truth. Now, this idea to say that the innocently mistaken non-Muslim will not be punished in the afterlife by a just God is something which, of course, has precedent before him. Okay, and we see Mirza Qumi reviving the ideas attributed with the 9th century Mu'tazili thinker Al-Jahiz, but has also influenced Usuli scholars after him, a range of later modern Shia Usuli. So we see this idea picked up in Sheikh Al-Ansari's works, in Ayatollah Khomeini's works, in Alama Tabatabai's works, and in Mutahari's works. Now, all of these guys had to respond to a certain question, and Mirza Qumi deals with it explicitly. He says, what about the consensus, the agreement of Muslims, that the kuffar are amongst the people of the fire? The kuffar are min ahl nar what was Mirza Qumi's response? Mirza Qumi's response to this is that that consensus can only apply to those who are willfully negligent, okay? Those who are blameworthy because of their incorrect belief. What were his justifications? Now, I mentioned these justifications because each of them are elaborated on by Ayatollah Sani when he discusses the cases of um, non-Muslims in his jurisprudential works. So for Mirza Qumi, is to punish one whose errors were despite their best efforts is an act of oppression. This is kabir and unascribable to a just God. If somebody's errors are not their own fault, we can't hold them accountable. They are qasir, they are not muqasir. And to punish them would be unascribable to a just God. Mirza Qumi goes on, he says, the apparent meaning of those texts from the Quran and in the Sunnah, which suggests that the kuffar are destined to the hellfire should be read in accordance with the immediate sense of the term kuffar. What he said, what he refers to as the mutabadir, okay, of this word. And that is referring to those who are obstinate in their rejection of faith, those who are accountable for their errors, those who are willfully negligent, and not all Muslims. He cites a hadith to support his views, which we see later on Ayatollah Sani also sites and his own justifications and this is taken from man la yahdur al faqi reporting a um, a portion of the second khutbah um, narrated by imam ali salam allah on the, on a on a friday where imam ali prays allahumma adhib kafarata min ahli al kitab oh god punish the kafara those who do kufr from amongst the people of the book those who place obstacles on your path who obstinately deny your signs and who reject your messengers. The point here is that this punishment which Imam Ali is calling for, okay, is from those who do kafir from amongst the people of the book. Going on to define, okay, who it is that this punishment is called upon, i.e. those who actively seek to prevent the, 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 the development of Islam, those who obstinately deny, okay, or knowingly deny, your signs and reject your messages. Of course, for Mirza Qummi, despite this, he still felt that the innocently mistaken non Muslim can be treated as a kafir in this world. So for Mirza Qummi, in the hereafter, okay, it would be immoral, unjust for God to punish the innocent non Muslim for errors in their belief. But in this world, okay, the distinction between kafir and Muslim 
okay, is not um, one which is considered immoral. Ayatollah Sani'i extends this argument. Okay, he says that the innocently mistaken is not punished by a just God at all, in any sense of the word. All right, as Ayatollah Muhakik said, he has this huge emphasis, okay, on a theological notion of divine justice, you know, a Quranic a basis of divine justice. And rationally, he elaborates on Mirza Qumi's argument, okay, citing that, um, you know, foundational theological Adliya premise of Qub al Bila Bayan, that it is blameworthy to punish without proper notice. Okay, it's immoral to punish without proper notice. Okay, if somebody hasn't fully understood the evidence, there's obstacles to their understanding of the truth, then clearly they cannot be punished. Okay, it would be immoral to punish them. It would be unfair if somebody didn't know any better to hold them to account. Yeah, or for Sani to discriminate against them. He cites textual evidences to support this. For example, the famous ayah from Surah Al Isra, "Wa ma kunna mu'adhibin hatta nabatha rasula." We do not punish until we have sent a messenger. Ayatollah Sani, in his discussion here, points out how modern Shia usulis typically use this ayah to justify, okay, the important principle of bara'a or exemption, okay, used in usul al fiqh when there is a doubt about a possible duty. Now here, he points out how Usulis have typically understood that messenger includes a sense of evidence, okay, or argument. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accordingly can be understood from this verse to imply that we do not punish somebody until they have a complete argument or a complete evidence. He goes on to say that the Quran and the Sunnah explicitly identify or define the kuffar as those who are willfully negligent before the truth and are obstinate deniers or stubborn rejectors of the truth. He cites the same dua which we mentioned above from Imam Ali. He cites an extensive hadith from Imam Sadiq on the different types of kufr and the category of kufr which is referred to as kufr al ma'rifa, okay, in light of um, the Ayah from the Quran 2714, wa 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 okay, referring to those um, you know, in the times of Pharaoh who um, obstinately denied the truth despite having believed in it. I won't go into the details here because of time. He mentions, you know, he cites the uh, various tafasir literature, you know, seeks recourse from Alama Taba Taba'i and his own um, discussion of the 24th verse from the 54th, 50, 45th um, surah, all to support and ground his views. You see, Ayatollah San is building his ideas, okay, from a fundamental Shia theological um, basis, developed out of his reading of the Quran and Sunnah, citing precedent from his views amongst the ulama, okay? Finally, he goes to the lexical meaning of the term kufr, which means simply, Okay, to conceal or to cover. He cites here, for example, the whole lexical co um, canon, Al-Raghib Isfahani, the Mufradat of Jawahiri, the Taj al yeah, uh, of um, Firuz Abadi, Kamus al-Muhit, okay, Lisan al-Arab, um, so on and so forth. And also goes to cite some modern Shia um, Usulis as well in their discussion of the linguistic sense of Kufr, that Kufr and Kafir means to conceal or to cover. And of course, there is no concealment without understanding. Okay, so somebody can only be said to be a kafir if they have understood the truth and then they cover it or reject it. So with this package of arguments, which took their, um, you know, which built from existing arguments that we see in the case of Mirza Kumbi, Sani'i argues that the apparent sense of the term kafir and the technical sense of the term kafir, okay, as understood in fiqh, should only refer to the obstinate rejector, okay, not all Muslims, in this world, whether it's with reference to this world, or whether it's in reference to the next. Accordingly, for Ayatollah Sani, the ahkam of kufr, you know, the rulings regarding the kafir, do not apply to the vast majority of non-Muslims. 
So Sani largely accepts the traditional rules that we find in fiqh, that we would find in, for example, the Urwat al Wuthqa of Qadim Yazdi, which Ayatollah Muhakkik mentioned. He would accept these traditional rules, but he changes their scope. For example, humans are assumed to be Tahir, not ritually impure, as long as they don't have doctrinal obstinacy, what he calls Inad ad as long as they are not a Kafir in the proper sense. So it's only the one who knows the truth and rejects it who has question marks over the ritual purity. The vast majority of Muslims, the vast majority of non Muslims, can be assumed to be ritually pure. The idea that zakat can be given um, to non Muslims is something he advocates, so long as they are not Kafir. Non Kafir, non Muslims can inherit from a Muslim. And leaving Islam out of choice and an actual belief that Islam is wrong is not irtidad or legal apostasy. For Ayatollah Sani'i, the rulings regarding irtidad and or, or what I'm translating here is legal apostasy were only for the kafir in the proper sense. Okay, the one who became an active and stubborn rejecter of Islam despite knowledge of the truth of Islam. So we see a remarkably consistent application of traditional ideas. He built these traditional ideas grounded on this fundamental acceptance of divine justice, okay, in light of precedent within Shia Usuli discourse, okay, but was frankly brave enough to apply this, okay, yeah, across the Abwab fiqh. I don't think this constitutes a new method of ijtihad, nor a paradigm shift in legal theory. It's just a commitment and a continuity, okay, very much with traditional ideas, irrespective of, you know, how provocative some of the um, conclusions may have been. So I'll give, if I have time, I think I still have three or four minutes, I'll give one um, final, bit more detailed example. And that was his view of, um, regarding marriage with non-Muslims. And here we see, I've taken this from, from his Ta'liqa ala Tahrir al-Wasila. So these are his comments to um, Ayatollah Khomeini's um, version of the famous Ras uh, Rasala Amaliyah. Okay, and he argues, he accepts that it's impermissible to marry a kafir. Okay, why? Because through his kufr, okay, defined as his covering of truthful belief and his stubbornness of opposition to belief, the kafir, like the mushrikun, invites toward the fire. And he's, of course, alluding to the 221st verse of Surah Al-Baqarah here, whilst Allah, with his permission, Wallah, okay, bi'idnihi yad'u ila al-jannah wal-maghfirah, and whilst Allah, with his permission, invites towards the garden and forgiveness. So marrying the kafir is haram, in accordance with the prohibition which we find in um, Surah Al-Baqarah, and as Ayatollah Sani puts it, the illa, which is within that verse, the yad'u ila nar they call the kafir and the mushrikeen, Okay, call towards the fire. But explicitly, Ayatollah Sani says, this is not applicable to the majority of non-Muslims today. Okay, this is not the case for a non-Muslim who is not a kafir in that way. Somebody who is innocently mistaken in their unbelief. Somebody who is not stubbornly opposing the truth. Or is under the a protection of Islam and, and its security. Or there is a pact of mutual respect and security between that person and the rest of the Muslims. I'm quoting here, like the majority of the non-Muslims today, if not the entirety of them, with the exception of those who are at war with the Muslims or those who assist them. So we see continuity, or we see change through a continuity with tradition. And for Ayatollah Sani, actually still in this discussion, you know, in his extensive footnote on Ayatollah Khomeini's comments regarding um, nikah to a um, kafir, Sani says it was only in his view, and of course he was a committed student of um, Ayatollah um, Khomeini, Sani argues that it was only socio-political considerations which held Ayatollah Khomeini back on such matters. Okay, yeah, and we see that Ayatollah Sani is positioning his ideas in continuity with his teacher, he's building on usuli precedent and method in light of fundamental aspects of Shia thought. He continues in that same note, emphasizing those points which have already been highlighted to us this morning, okay, that Allah drives towards justice 
and the absence of oppression in his rulings, any type of oppression is impossible for God. He mentions the verse of the Quran, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْكًا وَعَدْلًا The words of your Lord are complete in truth and justice. وَمَا رَبُّكَ بِذَلَّامٍ لِلْأَبِيدِ Your Lord is not oppressive to his servant. And then uh, he states that punishment of any sorts in the hereafter or in this world without full clarity, okay, without full exposition, okay, is immoral and something which cannot be ascribed to a just God. We see that Sa'ayatul Asani, okay, used fundamental Shia resources, okay, um, in continuity with tradition for a contemporary rereading of the rules of Sharia. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept his efforts and bless his souls and allow us to benefit from those ideas which are useful to us and are good for us. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.